Excellent. So welcome to Math Slash Stats 341. Out of curiosity, how many people, I don't care if you've registered for it this way, how many of you view yourself taking this as a stats course? Okay. How many of you view this as taking it as a math course? How many of you believe that the two of them are fundamentally intertwined and you don't really want to show favoritism? <laughs> I, I, I have to raise my hand because otherwise I'll get into trouble. So for those of you who are stats senior majors, there's going to be the kickoff stats colloquium that will be at 12.30. Uh, so essentially right after this, go to the Math Stats Library. There will be pizza and statistics, what could be better. All right. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about what this class is going to be. This is a 300 level Math Stats course. So this means this is going to be a fast moving class. It is going to be intense. There's going to be a lot of work to be done. It is designed to function for a diverse audience. So how many people here are also econ majors? Also physics majors? CS, history, English. So you know, you see that there's a lot of different uh, groups represented here. Uh, chemistry. No chemistry. I don't see. Oh, okay. Uh, biology. Okay. So you know, we we've got people from lots of different areas. If there are types of examples you want me to incorporate into the class, let me know. One of my favorite examples is naval warfare. Is the Battle of Trafalgar is an excellent example of applications of probability and differential equations. I do not believe Horatio Nelson actually wrote down and did the calculations, but he just intuitively had a great sense of what was going on. And so my goal is to teach you material that can be used for many stages of the rest of your life. This class is going to move at a fast pace. There is going to be programming. I will do a programming lecture. I do not care what language you use. If you use a language that I'm familiar with or that the TAs are familiar with, we will be more able to help you. But a lot of coding is the same. You just change the syntax. You change the language a little bit. If there's a language you're comfortable with, if you want to do it in R or Python, that's fine. My number one go-to language is Mathematica because when I was an undergraduate, Mathematica was readily available. It has a lot of good user-defined functions. And so later today, I will show you some examples for Mathematica code. All right. So in probability theory, the goal is to model the real world. For those of you who are considering careers in academia, you can actually forget about this you know, real world stuff. But most of you are probably not going to do that. You're going to go off into finance, or you might be a rebel and go off into consulting. I, you know, there's lots of choices. And so the question is, how do you take a very complicated problem from the real world? If anybody is interested, in my finite wisdom, I decided to join the school committee for the towns of Williamstown and Lanesboro. And right now we are very close to finishing a 10-year process on a new building. This is going to require a budget in the order of 60 to 70 million dollars. There's going to be a significant reimbursement coming from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The rest is going to be divided up between the two towns. And the question is, what is the most equitable way to divide up the cost between the two towns based on projected enrollments of students, based on projected property values, for those of you who know about the Lanesboro Mall, Best Buy has just announced they're pulling out. With Amazon and so much stuff going online, the question is how viable a mall is going to be in the future. So we're going to have probability models to try to figure out uh, what should the agreements be between the two towns. If anybody is interested in doing some real world applications and working with me on this, I've got the data, I'm committed to doing this, and this is something that will be voted on and used. So if you want some real experience, there's some incredible opportunities. I used to say that one of the three most important classes you could take was a probability class. It's up there with statistics and programming. I used to say you would always have a job if you took these three classes. The reason I no longer say this is a couple of years ago, someone sued her institution when she did not get a job upon graduation. And so now I have to be a little bit more careful. And <laughs> unless you promise that you'll sue Williams and not myself. But it is very likely you will have a job if you take probability, statistics, and programming. You may not enjoy your job, <laughs> but you will have a job, and the job will pay a reasonable amount of money. Now, what's great is because of the Freedom of Information Act, you can actually download her lawsuit where she misspells words like tuition. <laughs> she also claims discrimination, that the college did more for people with higher GPAs than lower GPAs, and that her 2.6 was just as good as someone else's 3.6. So, <laughs> that's outside what I'm able to explain. I can't quite do that, but I can do the mathematics behind stuff. So objectives, obviously I want you to learn probability. 
I want to emphasize the techniques and asking the right questions. So the person we saw a moment ago, uh, we did a project involving a question my son asked when he was four and my daughter was two. And the question was, if two people are born at the same time, do they die at the same time? And other than you directly murdering an identical twin in front of my kids, which is not socially acceptable, you know, how do you explain randomness to a four-year-old? And so we found a really nice way to do this. This is something we'll talk about later in the semester. I want to talk a lot about proposing problems and models and how to analyze them. Anybody familiar with what Galileo is famous for? What's the big experiment Galileo did? Okay. Yes, he... Drop things off. Things, yes, excellent. Can we be a little bit more technical than things? Cannonballs. Cannonballs. Yes, and does anybody remember the color of the two objects? Black and yellow or white. Yeah, bronze and red. Damn it, you guys are good. You're, you're at least saying it so confidently I can't claim that you're wrong. <laughs> I have no idea what color they were. <laughs> Why do I have no idea what color they were? It probably doesn't matter. Now, if you have the cannonball outside maybe for three hours on a hot, sunny day, the black might actually absorb heat better, and then if it's hot as it's falling through the air, that could have some small effects. Uh, for the record, I'm a New England Patriots fan. I can talk to you about how heat can adjust <laughs> various values <laughs> ad nauseum. <laughs> but it does matter in certain circumstances how hot an object is. Probably in a situation like this, I don't think the color really matters. So when you're choosing your model, you want to focus on which objects, which quantities really matter. A big thing is elegant solutions versus brute force. If you can have a closed form solution, if you can see how the answer varies as you adjust your parameters, this is wonderful. You can then say, well, all of a sudden, let me increase this value by 10% and let's see what this does. And maybe it's not that expensive to increase it by 10% and you have this huge gain and it's worth doing. Or maybe it's extremely expensive to increase this by 10% and the amount of gain is negligible. And so you know, a lot of times you'll actually see this sadly in safety control. You know, there will be certain companies that say, you know, damn it, our products are not feeling enough. Our quality control is too good. You know, we could have a much cheaper quality control and we'd only have one or two more failures. You know, it's negligible. It becomes a very interesting calculus to do as to how accurate, how precise do you want things to do. A lot of times, unfortunately, especially in economics and real world disciplines, you do not have closed form solutions. Your model is so complicated, so many things are involved, you have to resort to numerical simulations. And this is one of the reasons why there's going to be a strong programming component to this class. You are not well versed in probability if you cannot do simulations. In an ideal world, you would be able to cull data from the web and analyze it directly. I'm not going to require people to do something like that. I encourage you to learn how to do that. Take some more stats classes. Take data mining. There is so much information out there. You are at a competitive disadvantage if you don't know how to use it and work with it. But for a lot of complicated problems, you can simulate the answers without too much trouble. And what's really nice is, rather than doing a very difficult theoretical calculation, you can write a few lines of computer code and pretty much estimate the correct value to within a couple of decimal points within a few seconds. And this is one of the abilities, one of the powers of being able to write code. So another thing I want you to get out of this course is to look at complicated formulas and get a sense for what they're saying. Any baseball fans here? All right. So based on how well the Sox are performing this year, my main teams are anybody playing the Yankees, the North Adams Steeple Cats, and my kids' Little League teams. <laughs> uh, but that's not where the money is. The money is Major League Baseball. So how many of you have either read Moneyball or seen the movie? I've actually met a lot of people involved in uh, the book. So if you want, at some point I can have firsthand recollections, but I will not have them while I'm recording the lectures. There's a lot of very interesting facts about sabermetrics, applying mathematics and statistics to baseball. If you don't like baseball, you can always apply this to the stock market, mutual funds, companies, stuff like that. It's the same general ideas. You have often very complicated formulas, and you want to get a sense of what is right or not. So this is one of my favorite formulas. We'll talk about this maybe later. It's called the log 5 method. Do not ask why it's called log 5. If team A wins P percent of their game, and team B wins Q percent of their games, and they play, what's the probability team A beats team B? A really good predictor is one of the following four quantities. 
P plus or minus PQ over P plus Q plus or minus 2PQ. And we'll talk a little bit more later in the semester, too. If you take a formula like this, how can you analyze and see if it, this is reasonable? It is very easy to make mistakes, to make algebraic mistakes when you are doing calculations. If at the end of the day you can step back and look at the formula and ask, is this reasonable? Does this jive with my expectations? Can anybody give me something that should be true about this formula for special values of P and Q? What's something that should be true? Probably about like zero and one. I'm sorry? It should always be between zero and one. So if I'm ever getting that the probability that you know, the team wins is greater than one or that the team loses is less than zero, no matter how bad the Sox and I think the Phillies are going this year, that's not going to happen. So that's one quick check. Any other quick checks you can think of? Any other special cases where you know the answer? No, because P is the probability that A wins against a generic opponent, and Q is the probability that B wins against a generic opponent. So this is where notation matters. Most of the time, people use Q to represent 1 minus P. I could do P sub A and P sub B rather than P and Q to make the formula a little bit cleaner. So it was a good try, but... If uh, P is 0, the whole thing is just... Yeah, if, if P is 0, you should lose. What if P equals 1? It should be one. OK, so then, so then maybe as long as Q is not one, as long as we don't have the, two, the clash of the undefeated. Years ago, or actually I guess decades ago, my brother and his best friend were playing an old Apple baseball game. And they were able to create their own players. And my brother created the ultimate pitcher. Every time he faced a batter, what do you think he did? Struck him, Struck him out. out. Not to be outdone, my brother's friend created the ultimate hitter. What do you think he did? Home runs every time. So the ultimate hitter faces the ultimate pitcher, and the computer just hangs for a couple of minutes, trying to figure out, what the hell do I do? <laughs> After a while, the computer, I, I was truly amazed with the answer the computer came up with. It was the only logical answer in hindsight. Dang, that no. <laughs> <laughs> Who's he lost? No. Double. Nope. Double. Uh, Double. There's a double. Batter always gets four bases. Pitcher always yields zero bases. So the computer decided, we'll split the difference. We'll give him a double. So you, know, you want to be able to look at a question and see what is a reasonable answer. All right. There's a lot of different types of problems we can look at. This is your chance to control your education. If there are things you want to see, let me know and I'll try to work in. You know, biology, you know, will a species survive? You know, physics, chemistry, number theory. Uh, how many of you have taken linear algebra? Hand should be going up at this point. If not, you know, we'll talk. But it turns out matrices model a lot of quantities in the world. And it turns out you can use matrices to talk about propagating from one state to the next. And a lot of problems are extremely complicated. And the idea is there's a specific matrix. And the eigenvalues of this matrix govern what happens. Okay? Do you know ways to find eigenvalues of matrices? Okay. Most of you have probably learned bad ways to find eigenvalues of matrices. If you're thinking, I'll use the determinant of A minus lambda I, this is not numerically stable, and these matrices are a little bit large. To give you a sense of how large they're infinite by infinite. Also, we don't know any of their entries. <laughs> so, you know, we, we basically can reduce a lot of things in the real world to finding the eigenvalues of an infinite by infinite matrix where we don't know any of the entries. Good luck making progress. The idea is to say, you know, screw this. What we're going to do instead is we're going to write down a very large n by n matrix, and we're going to choose the entries at random. And we'll calculate what the eigenvalues are. And then we'll choose another matrix, and another, and another, and another. And then we'll look at average properties of the matrix eigenvalues. And it turns out in a lot of problems, these average properties do a phenomenal job of describing what's going on in the real world. And so this is random matrix theory. It's occurring throughout number theory, mathematics, physics, chemistry. Uh, how many of you are into gambling? For me, just theoretically. Just theoretically. Gambling is a wonderful source of problems and probability. In fact, a lot of the subject was not surprisingly motivated by uh, gambling questions. If you know enough math, sometimes it's not a gamble. And so I will talk to you about situations like this where you can exploit people's lack of knowledge. I am not condoning this. <laughs> I am just stating what can be done. Okay, um, 
We will talk about finance, we'll talk about Monte Carlo integration. How many of you have taken Calc 2? What do you learn in Calc 2? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to give such a hard question on the first day of class. <laughs> what did you learn in Calc 1? We'll start off easier. In Calc 1 you learned how to? All right, good. And then you learned in Calc 2? Integrate. Why? Why did you spend a whole semester learning how to integrate? Well, that's what the teacher told me to study. Well, wh why do we care about integrating? Why do we care about finding areas under the curve? Only once in my life has someone on the street come up to me asking for an area under the curve. And I was in the Berkeley area of California at the time. Why do we care about areas under curves? Turns out areas under curves represent probabilities of events. The big lie in Calc 2, and I'm sorry, um, I won't talk about Santa Claus, Tooth Fairy, or anything like that. I'll just confine myself to mathematically dashing things you've been taught. We can't integrate in general. We cannot get closed form solutions to most integrals. We have to work very hard in Calc 2 to give you problems that you can write down in closed form. The real world is not like that. It turns out that you can do something called Monte Carlo integration, which is essentially throwing random dots at a board. I sometimes do this. I have to check and see with the new zero tolerance policy if I'm allowed to bring the dots to the classroom. If so, I will bring them later in the semester. By throwing dots at a blackboard, you can actually use this to find integrals to incredible accuracy very quickly. And this is one of the most important uses of probability. It's to find areas under curves. Um, I've done a lot of applied work over the years. Any movie fans here? Okay. What, is a, what is the objective of a movie theater? Make money. Right. The objective of almost any company should be to make money. Now you can ask, how does the movie theater make money? Packing in the most number of seats in any given room. That's one strategy. Snacks. Snacks. So you have two different things. Do you want to have, and I'll, I'll be careful because this is being recorded, we're going to have a Golden Girls marathon. Uh, anybody remember the TV show Golden Girls? You know, uh, four old ladies in Florida. And we're going to just have all day in the movie theater, we're going to show episode of Golden Girls after Golden Girls. Or we're going to have some you know, action movies. Which do you think will draw more people? Part of it is a function of time of day. You know, at certain times of day, you, know, you might have more old people who aren't working, aren't in school, they can come down. But you also care about who's going to spend the most on snacks. How much money do you get from each seat? Uh, this is, I'm afraid to ask this, how many of you remember when Phantom Menace came out? So this was when, well, um, this is being recorded, I'll stop. Uh, so when Phantom Menace came out, George Lucas had so much bargaining power, he could tell movie theaters that if you want to show my movie, you have to show it on your best screen. The sound system must be at least at this level, because otherwise you will not be able to truly appreciate Jar Jar and the other <laughs> fine things I have done. <laughs> and you must show it for at least this many weeks. And the way deals with movie theaters often work is the company gets less th that owns the movie. They get less and less of the ticket sales each week. So in the first week, they get the most, the highest percentage, and towards the end, they get very little. Why do you think the movie the companies that own the movies are willing to do this? Most yeah, most sales come in the beginning. And so when George Lucas is requiring the movie to be shown for so many weeks, the movie theaters are trying to estimate, well, how much are we going to get in ticket sales in those later weeks? How much are we going to get in concession sales? There are some movie theaters that essentially give away the movie for free. You know, it's a dollar to come in. They want you to buy the popcorn and the soda. And so there's a lot of really good mathematics a lot of probability in terms of trying to figure out how to optimally run a movie theater. And so I've worked with a couple of marketing professors exactly on this project, and we actually have a system that's being implemented in a uh, movie uh, theater, where they take into account and they try to extrapolate the best predictions of movies. You know, what do we think the demands will be for the movies? What do we think the concession demands will be for the different types of movies? What do we think our prop uh, uh, profits will be? Any bridge players here? If anybody's interested in learning how to play bridge, let me know. It is the first time I ever swore at one of my students. When I was teaching probability here, 
he made such a bad bridge mistake, I was you know, very calm. And then he did it again immediately the very next second. And just two times in a row was too much for me. Uh, but I think other than that, I've gotten much better and mellower as I've gotten older. Bridge is a wonderful game. It's a nice game to play for fun. A lot of it is trying to estimate probabilities. And so you, know, you have a standard deck, you have four players, and you try to estimate how likely is it that the opposing teams have certain cards, that they have certain distributions. And so the ability to do these calculations is extremely important. One of the most interesting stories about this is when they started using computer shuffling programs, a lot of bridge players complained that these programs were not working. They weren't giving the right distribution of hands. It turns out the computer programs were working correctly. People were not shuffling fully randomly. And there's been now a huge amount of research done as to how do you shuffle a deck randomly. And so the hands that were actually being played in real life, being mixed up by people, were not fully randomized. Uh, other applications are cryptography. Uh, for those of you who enjoy bidding uh, bridge, there's a way to use cryptography in bridge and to encrypt your bids. It's been declared illegal in most uh, games, but if anybody's interested, I'm happy to explain those rules to you. All right. So some of my experiences in using probability in the real world. So I've already mentioned you know, the new one, uh, which is work in progress about trying to figure out how we should assign the capital costs of the renovation addition to the regional high school. You know, I've worked for movie theaters trying to use probability and linear programming to come up with optimal schedules. I've done a lot of work with the Internal Revenue Service. And so there's a beautiful theorem or a result called Benford's Law of Digit Bias. So if you were to just think randomly, and I take a huge collection of numbers, how often do you think the first digit is a one? Just your first instinctive guess. If you haven't seen this before, what's the answer I want? What percent of the time should your first digit be a one? 10%. Then you realize you had a brain freeze because you're not going to start off with a zero. So you correct your one tenth to one ninth. The actual answer is about 30%. Human beings are often very bad random number generators. We put patterns in and we avoid patterns that should be there. And you can use this to detect fraud. And so the Internal Revenue Service actually does stuff like this to determine if a report is likely to be fraudulent. And then they use their resources sometimes to determine uh, by digging deeper if some fraud has actually happened. Uh, another example for applied probability is sabermetrics. I've worked, as I've said, with some major league franchises. I'm happy to chat about stuff like that. All right. So just some course mechanics. So we are going to be moving at an extremely fast pace. All right. If you do not read ahead of time, if you do not put material in the bank, you will have trouble with this class. This is a 300 level class. I am not going to be able to cover everything possible. Fortunately, I know the author who wrote the book. Uh, I really like the way this person presents stuff and I like the amount of details this person has chosen. So I'm quite confident that the details are there. But if you ever find out that you don't like the way it's being presented there, talk to me. I'm happy to try to explain it to you another way. Or just take out another book on probability. You should have multiple books and look at maybe another formulation is better for you and let me know if something in the book is not particularly clear. I want to try to save class time for where it's going to be most effective, talking about big picture issues and not doing algebra in public. I read the stuff ahead of time. There's also handouts online about what you should be getting out of each section as you read it beforehand so that you have some idea coming to class. This doesn't mean if I drop dead, you can take the class. It would be nice, but it doesn't mean that it means you have some idea of what we're going to talk about. So if the lecture for the day is on Stirling's formula, you should probably know what Stirling's formula says. If it's going to be on conditional probability, you should probably know what the definition of conditional probability is. If you try to process math in real time, you may be better than I am. I have a lot of trouble processing math, writing it down, and having it really sink in and following what's going on. If you can spend some of the time beforehand in class, beforehand at home, reading the stuff, so it's now a second pass on the material in class, it will go much better. In exchange for this on the honor code, you all have 5% of your grade is 100. I do not grade on a curve. If everybody gets an A, everybody gets an A, I'll talk to the registrar. If everybody gets an A, I'm sorry, this is Williams. If everybody gets an E, I will also talk to the registrar. For the record, I have taught a class at Williams where everybody once got the highest grade possible, and there were 60 students in that class. So I am willing to have this conversation. Okay? So 5% of your grade is automatically an A. I trust you as William students. You have 
two exemptions. There can be two days where just things are busy and you're not prepared for class. Email me and let me know that you're not prepared. But otherwise, I will assume you are prepared for class. It will make the semester go a lot better for you to do this. So homework is 15%. There'll be some writing assignments that will be 10%. There'll probably be two midterms. Unless you tell me otherwise, I will drop your lowest midterm. Uh, it's extremely unlikely you would want me to drop your higher midterm. Uh, if so, you have more math problems than just what was being shown on that exam. Uh, the final exam will be 40%. There's also the option to do a project on anything you want as long as we can somehow relate it to probability, which will count as 10% of your grade, and then I will adjust everything accordingly. And this is your chance to really control your education. You know, you might want to explore some subject in greater detail. Maybe you're taking measure theory and you want to see about the measure theoretic approach to a lot of these results in probability. Maybe you're doing history and you want to see more about the Battle of Trafalgar and the consequences of mathematics and warfare. All right, so the prereqs for this class is Calculus 3, Linear Algebra, Basic Combinatorics and Set Theory. I will review all the terms I need from that and Linear Algebra. All right, if I am in my office, it's office hours. If you email me, I am usually fairly good at responding. I will respond essentially within three hours between 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. We have two TAs for this class. They will have review sessions three days a week. The first review session will be this Sunday. I think it's from 8 to 9. I'll double check and let you know. Uh, the first homework assignment is not that difficult. I don't think you really need to talk to the TAs about the first homework assignment. But you should already be starting the second homework assignment. Some of the questions you will not be able to do yet. Some of them you will be able to do. The last question is actually a question from calculus. Start working on your homework beforehand. It will make things a lot easier. It will make things more effective. Uh, the other thing, and this is not just for the class, if you want to contact me anonymously, you may use the email address eavesmath at gmail.com. The password is williams1793. It used to be the Fibonacci numbers, but somebody changed the password. All I ask is please don't change the password. It's a real pain to talk to Gmail. And you can talk to me about concerns and issues you have with this class. And I am happy to respond anonymously to you through the account. You can talk about concerns you have at other things uh, at Williams or beyond. I was at an institution once where the students knew me from a previous class and they had no problems coming up to my office and closing the door, which is always a bad sign. And you ask, what's going on? Uh, we're supposed to be in group theory. And then they stopped talking. So you know, I was younger then, I was not so hand-holding. So, okay, so go to group theory. Why are you in my office? Well, the professor's not teaching group theory. I'm, I'm sorry? He prepared Gawa theory over the summer. Did you tell him this? Yes. What did he say? He said, well, how much group theory do you need to know for Gawa theory? I'll teach you the group theory you need to know in a week. Not surprisingly, they felt a little bit uncomfortable going to the professor of that class saying, could you please teach what you're supposed to teach? So, you know, again, if there are anything going on, you know, if you are not vocal, there's no way we're going to be able to divine what's going on. So please, I hope you feel comfortable enough to talk to me, but if not, shoot me an email. All right. right now it looks like everybody has a seat, so for those people who are on the wait list, it looks like we will be able to get you into the class. All right, so other stuff. You will learn that I love email, and I send lots and lots of emails. I put a lot of information on the web page. Every day I will post additional comments on the lectures. These are entirely optional. But these are ways of looking at you know, additional applications of the material, or just ways of maybe reviewing and rehashing some of the stuff we've seen. Uh, clickers, every now and then I will give you clicker questions. I will provide the clickers uh, based on the size. We may not have enough clickers, so some people may have their votes marginalized. Uh, one of the things I do want you to do is I want you to prepare your own homework problems at some points throughout the semester. Writing your own problem is a great way to see how well you understand the material. It's a wonderful exercise. Uh, the last, as I've said before, prepare for class. This is probably important based on how many times I'm emphasizing this. Okay, so please, read the material before class. The other thing is, prepare several classes ahead. Build up a strategic reserve so that when life happens, you, know, you can afford all of a sudden to devote less time to this class. As a warning, I believe in working you extremely hard at the beginning of the semester and coasting towards the end of the semester. The reason I do this is I know a lot of my colleagues sometimes are not so good at planning throughout the whole semester and realize that of the seven books we were supposed to read, we've only read two of them, and sometimes the workload increases exponentially towards the end. I try to run things in the reverse, where we work extremely hard in the beginning of the semester, and then I use the very end of the semester to just do advanced general application lectures that show you how you use the material and just 
linking everything together as a way of preparing for the final. So I do apologize in advance for the lack of homework at the end of the semester. Okay, so one thing is you never know when an opportunity will present itself. You always want to be prepared. So this is in uh, building off, you know, being prepared for class. Uh, about a year or so ago, my advisor had a birthday conference celebrating his 61st birthday. It turns out that when you get old, if you're in academia, what you want for your birthday is a conference. And so there were maybe 200 people, including some of the strongest mathematicians in the world, a small number of people were going to speak at the birthday dinner. As soon as I found out that there was going to be some people speaking, what do you think I did? Prepared a speech. Even though I was not told I was going to be one of the people speaking. It would be extremely embarrassing to be handed the microphone in front of your people who can control my career and crush me at a moment's notice and say, my advice are really good, thank you. You, know, you want to have something prepared. So in some sense, this is related to why you're at a school like Williams. You should be able to converse on almost any topic for anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. After that, they can find out you know, that you really don't know anything. But you should be able to fake it for at least a certain amount of time. This is one of the advantages of a liberal arts. Probability is a wonderful topic. There's a lot of fun things we can do. There's a lot of opportunities with stuff like this. So you are actually working. You don't get paid. You, know, you actually pay us for the privilege of working for us. But your job is to be prepared for class. It's to do the readings, to be thinking about the materials, to be thinking about how you can use this, to be trying to think about what do you want to do after Williams in addition to giving back large amounts of money. Um, what can you do to help you be able to give back large amounts of money? And what can we do to help you figure out which path is right? My job is to provide resources, to provide guiding questions, to try to make this fun, to try to show you what can be out there, and to be available. So we are here because we want to talk to you. I was at an institution, I will not mention where. Uh, it was actually at the same institution where the professor taught the wrong class, where office hours were 8.30 a.m. the day after homework was due. What message does this send? Now, if you're going to choose a time for office hours, 8.30 a.m. the day after homework is due sends a pretty strong signal, right? Don't bother me. You know, this is not Williams. We want you to come to our office. I want to get to know you. I am a little bit different than some of my colleagues. I deliberately do not try to get to know my students beforehand. I don't spend time looking you guys up on the Facebook stuff and you know, trying to match faces to people. I want you to come to me and get me to know who you are. Because in the real world, this is how it's going to be you are going to need to get yourself distinguished. You are going to need to get yourself noticed. For those of you who haven't done the reading assignment yet, there's some really great advice on stuff like that. So I strongly encourage you, come and see me in my office. We'll grab a coffee, grab lunch, just chat. I want to get to know you. If you want to bring someone and have a small group, absolutely happy to do that. But you want to get to be known. You're going to need often letters of recommendation. I'm happy to be one of those people. You do not want a letter of recommendation that says so-and-so was physically present in class and as their transcript indicates, this is what they got in class. There are people who have letters of recommendation like that. These letters are even less valuable than nothing because they're basically saying, I don't know anybody who can write well for me. So there's a lot of opportunities to speak up. If you make a comment in class and it's a good comment, email me. I will add this to my spreadsheet. And then if I have to write letters of recommendation for you, I will go to that and I will actually use that to make specific stories. If you speak up in class and you make a bad comment, don't email me. I am so busy that I won't remember the bad comments that I made, I promise. Only credit for good comments. Uh, the reason there's a bag of M&Ms here is a couple of years ago some of my students rebelled when they found out that my kids get M&Ms for doing math problems, that they wanted to be treated the same as my children. So if you speak up, even if you're wrong, you get M&Ms. Okay? You can even get an M&M advance. So if you think you know, you're really hungry and you promise you'll speak up in class later, you can take some M&Ms ahead of time. Okay? All right, so my brother and I get along much better now that we no longer live together. I want to share three pieces of advice. So the first is party less than the person next to you. For those of you who are in the center of the class, uh, you have a little bit more uh, data than some of the people I apologize at the edges. Get work done. There's a lot of work. Learn how to uh, get it done. The other is take advantages of office hours and mentoring. And this goes back to what I was saying. You are in a fortunate situation at Williams where you are surrounded in all of your classes with people who want to be here and want to teach you. 
take advantage, get to know us, get to know myself, get to know the TAs, come and discuss the material with us. And the last, which is, I think is extremely valuable, is learn how to manage your time. No one else wants to do this. Get things done, get things done quickly. Get things out of your inbox. If you have a homework assignment, start doing some of the problems. How many people here are on some sports team? Okay, keep your hands up. For those of you who are on a sports team, how often do you do, you do better in the semesters where you are in sport? Keep your hand up. So everybody's hand, I think, has stayed up. That amazingly, in the semester where you have more demands on your time, you're better. I had, I had two campus jobs. It forced me to be extremely efficient in my time. This is one of the best things you can get out of this class. I apologize, most of you will probably use very little of the actual math you will learn in this class. But if you can learn how to manage your time, if you can learn how to get noticed, if you can learn how to discuss material, this is extremely valuable. The other thing is I'm happy to do practice interviews with people. You know, for those of you who are applying to the real world for things like jobs, happy to sit down and give you a practice. The other thing is if you have a big event coming up and you want to adjust a deadline, that's absolutely fine. Just let me know ahead of time. So a lot of times you have a big sporting event coming up, a big play, you're traveling, you're interviewing, let me know. Deadlines are absolutely flexible. Okay? All right. So now let's actually get to some mathematics. All right. So again, just for the record, because this is being recorded, I do not officially condone gambling. Okay. However, if you are going to gamble, you may want to consider the following items. So the following is a true story. In 2007, a friend of one of my favorite students of all time bet $500 at 1,000 to 1 odds that the Patriots would go undefeated and win the Super Bowl. Who are my NFL fans? Anybody know what happened in 2007? As a Patriots fan, it's, it's not just the Giants won. Oh, yeah, you guys went, uh, what, 18-1? Uh, so the Patriots were undefeated going into the Super Bowl. That's one aspect of the story. But it's not just the Giants won. Lawrence Tynes had a pretty good catch. Who do you root for? Bills. <laughs> All right, so I, I do have to apologize. I know this is being recorded. Do you know the joke about the Bills in the third world? Something about them not being good, I assume. Uh, okay, so do people know the joke? What, as soon as the Super Bowl is won by one of the teams, they put on the Super Bowl champion shirts, they have the beard, all the stuff, and they have the big celebration. How do they know which shirts to have prepared? They prepare both. It's the Princess Bride Iocane powder theory. Okay? They have both shirts prepared. The Buffalo Bills are the only team to make it to four consecutive Super Bowls. They lost all four. So for four years they were preparing Buffalo Bills world champions. And so the joke is that these shirts go somewhere and that these shirts are actually sent to the third world. And you have all these poor kids who say, ah, Mommy, Mommy, the Bills won again. <laughs> but no, it was more than a pretty good catch. So I think the next page is yes. It is a miraculous <laughs> catch where you know, the ball does not touch the ground as he somehow maintains control and goes down. And this ends the Patriots' undefeated Super Bowl se uh, season. The friend of the friend who had a 1,000 to one odds, who would have gotten $500,000 if the Patriots had held on, gets nothing. So he lost that wager. This is where it gets a little bit interesting. In the third quarter, Las Vegas calls him up. Not surprisingly, they have his phone number. Vegas is a little bit worried because the Patriots are leading. And they offer to buy back the bet at 300 to one odds. And the friend of the fence says, hell no, go Pats! So what was his mistake? Yes? So one thing is he was guaranteed winnings. He could have been guaranteed $150,000. Is it worth risking the hundred and fifty dollars for the 500000 A lot of it becomes a function of how likely are you to make that 500000 This is where probability comes in. What's your expected payoff? How risk averse are you? But this was not his mistake. His mistake was not taking the buyback. Anybody know what his mistake was? It actually happened before the game even began. He was supposed to bet on both teams. He should have bet on the Giants. Now, at the beginning of the year, if you bet on every team, you will actually lose money because they stack the odds so that there's a little bit in favor for the house. Somebody has to pay for Mr. Smith's suits. 
So if you just bet on all the teams, you will lose money. But by the time we get to the Super Bowl, all but two teams are gone. And if he bets on the Giants to win, and he puts down a second bet, if the Giant wins, he now gets money from that. If the Patriots win, he gets money from the first wager. He can guarantee himself some profit, especially because the Patriots were heavily favored. So the question becomes, how much to bet? So let's do a very simplified model. So we'll assume the Pats win with probability P, the Giants win with probability 1 minus P. So you bet $1 on the Giants, and if they win, you get X. Now, the, of course, the real question is, what do we think X is? You know, is it 3 to 1 odds, 5 to 1 odds, 2 to 1 odds? I don't know. So you know, that's going to be some kind of variable. So now imagine you bet B dollars on the Giants. We can calculate the expected winning. And so, you know, using, you can probably figure out by looking at the plot what value of x I have. I don't really care. Does this formula look reasonable for the expected winnings? You know, you've already bet $500, and now you're going to bet B dollars. You're going to lose that no matter what. If the Giants win, which happens with probability 1 minus P, you get back Bx. And if the Patriots win with probability P, you get this. So this is your expected value. We'll talk a lot more about expected values later in the semester. One of the main reasons expected values are so nice and so frequently used is expected values are linear. It's a linear operator. This is going to be extremely important later on. And so what you can do is you can figure out um, how much money you make, what's your expected value as you increase your bet. All right, so now we want to vary different quantities. Is it surprising? Well, I'll go to the next page. I'm going to just skip a little bit ahead. So by hedging, I want to just concentrate on this formula. You can ensure some winnings. So what we're going to do now is we're going to assume P equals 0.8. And I'm going to assume X equals 3. I'm going to place a bet of B dollars on the giants. So if B equals 0, is it possible that I make money? So let's say I don't put any money on the Giants. Is it possible that I could make some money? Yes. How would I make money? The Patriots win. Is it possible I could make no money? Yes. So if I bet nothing on the Giants, I could end up with nothing. If I bet a huge amount on the Giants, I'll guarantee myself of something. But eventually, if I start putting on too much money on the Giants, if the Patriots lose, I'm sorry, if the Patriots win, I now lose money. So not surprisingly, you know, if I put $500,000 on the Giants, you know, if the Patriots win, I get $500,000 from that. That perfectly balances out the $500,000 I would get from the Giants, and my net would be zero. So there's no reason to bet more than $500,000 on the Giants. What I'm doing here is I'm not plotting my expected winnings. I'm doing a very different quantity. I'm plotting my guaranteed winnings. So I'm looking for each case, worst case scenario. If I have a small amount of money on the Giants, what's my worst case scenario? Giants win. If I have a large amount of money on the Giants, what's my worst case scenario? Patriots win. So for each one, it's a very simple quantity. And you know, I can look, and I get a plot like this. Not surprisingly, as I increase the money I'm betting on the Giants, my minimum winnings is going up. And then it reaches some point of diminishing returns, and then it starts to go down. And so depending on these numbers, you, know, you can guarantee over $300,000 if he had just come to class. What's the difference between, say, making $330,000 and making $500,000? Is that a huge difference? much less than going from zero to $300,000. Especially when you factor in taxes. You know, if you just make you know, an extra $170,000, how much of that do you lose to taxes? The change in life for that potential extra $170,000 is just not worth it. And so this is one of the examples of you know, what you can do with basic probability. You can set up a very simple model. You can weigh the different alternatives. And then a lot of it is going to come down to what metric do you use. So the metric I'm doing here is I'm looking at worst case scenario. Is that the best metric to use? So what I'm going to do is the following. 
um, I need everybody in the class to agree to this and I need to get the registrars to approve. I'm going to flip a fair coin a hundred times. If it comes up heads even once, I will give everybody in the class an A+. Plus, and you don't have to do any work for the rest of the semester. And I will write the strongest possible letter of recommendation for you. If it comes up tail every single time, you will all be brutally killed. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll throw you to, uh, who's my Return of the Jedi fans? The pit of? Sarlacc. I'm sorry? Sarlacc. Yes. It's, it's, if it's not that, it's extremely close. You have one cultural extra credit point. <laughs> you can have it, absolutely. <laughs> So, what do you think? Yeah. You like this deal? I mean, the odds of no heads coming up, if it's a fair coin, we're talking about 1 over 2 to the 100. 2 to the 10th is about 10 cubed. So we're talking about 1 over 10 to the 6th. The odds are about 1 in a million that I will get 100 consecutive tails. And you'll all get A pluses, you'll all get letters of recommendation. But, you know, if I do happen to get the 100 you know, consecutive tails, you will all be thrown to the pit. This should hopefully be a very negative alternative. In this situation, is the odds so small that you're willing to risk? And in, in this situation, you're looking, you know, it's so small that this happens, I'm willing to take the chance. Because the expected value is so high, I'm quite happy to take a really bad alternative. Because it's so improbable. Most of the time, things are not going to be this extreme. And the question is trying to figure out what the right balance is. How much do you want to protect yourself? When you're doing investment theory for stocks and mutual funds, you, know, you can have a very ambitious portfolio, which could make you a lot of money, but you could have a lot of exposure to risk. How do you want to balance these different issues? So this is one of the things we'll talk about in this class. And the answer is going to depend on your own individual metrics. For a lot of problems in the real world, we will see that there are multiple answers depending on how you choose to evaluate things. So depending on what's important to you, you can actually have different answers to the same problem. Uh, how many of you have taken statistics? How many of you have done um, method of least squares and method of maximum likelihood? So you can get slightly different answers with predictors like this because you're, you're minimizing different quantities. So one of the big things is to write code. So this is a snippet of Mathematica code. I'll talk a little bit more about this. You put things in square brackets, and then you put an underscore to mean that these are the variables. So f is a function of p, x, and b. And here's my formula for f. Here's my formula for g. It's the minimum of these two quantities minus that. I'm going to plot the function. I'm going to put in these values for p and x, and I'm going to have b. And b is going to range from 0 to uh, 500,000. One of the nice things is Mathematica has what's called a manipulate feature. And this would allow me to actually make a movie and have various things uh, moving. I will post a video online on how to use Mathematica as well as some templates. But what you can do is, I'm not going to go through it now, you can actually have something like this. And you can change the value of x and the value of p and see how this actually varies. I will end, of course, with a happier note for Patriots fans. So how many people know this moment? What is this moment? The interception, right? This is what got Malcolm Bot uh, Butler the car that Tom Brady won for being Super Bowl MVP. He said, I've got enough cars, you can have it. Why was Butler able to do this? I like how you use the singular. They did it once. And they burned Butler on it. They scored a touchdown on him. This is the best example I know of about being prepared and just emphasizing how important it is. You don't know when the opportunity is going to come. And there's a lot of beautiful game theory as to what was going on. You know, did Pete Carroll make a mistake? And you know, again, it's tough to say because you know the outcome. Was his strategy a sound strategy? I actually, from the analysis I've looked at, the strategy of passing, I believe, was the right call. The problem was how long it took them to execute the play and passing up the middle. For those of you who remember the game, at the end of the first half, the Seahawks scored a touchdown with a pass towards the end. And by throwing the ball like that, you minimize the chance of an interception. You're running a route where only your receiver has a chance to make a play. By throwing the ball right into traffic, much more dangerous call, 
but the Patriots were prepared for this play. They had been practicing lots and lots of plays because they don't know what's going to be done, and they were ready for this one. All right, so I think this is a good place to stop. This will give us another minute or two if anybody has any questions, and then looking forward to the semester.